Hello, and welcome to this lecture entitled Academic History versus Public History, A Grudging Respect. One of the significant recurring themes of these lectures is the relationship between academic history and public history. I do this because it allows us to compare the familiar academic history infrastructure with the unfamiliar public history infrastructure. Sometimes it's easier to define a thing like public history by what it is not in addition to by what it is. Also, public history is an emerging subfield of the discipline of academic history, so it must prove its worth, you might say, methodologically. This is the same route traveled by other subfields seeking admission to academic departments. I've already introduced a few of the differences, real and perceived, between public and academic history, but let's look at them again and possibly in a little more depth. First, we should look at a short history of how history became a profession. As we understand it today, History was not really an employment option until the mid-19th century. Prior to that in universities, professors of history were really professors of classics who incorporated history often with mythology and ancient languages. Historical writers were usually gentlemen scholars of independent wealth or means. We usually credit Leopold von Ranke, shown here with establishing history as an academic discipline. He devised the seminar method that spread into the United States through his students and his students' students. These students usually received advanced training in the seminars by using archives and government records to conduct research that delivered new understandings and interpretations and even revealed evidence that was previously unknown. Students and successors of von Ranke developed versions of what you might call scientific history that eschewed literature as a source, that discounted narrative as a delivery system, and that demanded the use of primary sources from archives and records to support arguments that explained rather than recounted events. To gain employment, practitioners of history had to convince potential employers that they had an arcane body of knowledge and methods that could be transmitted only through higher education and that this body of knowledge and this method, a logical uh, method um, was useful for society at large or at least was useful for the resource providers like the government. Historians developed an infrastructure to protect and advance their professional employment, in part for selfish reasons, but mainly because they really believed they could contribute to the good of their nations and their societies. This meant that they fiercely protected their profession from encroachment and from devolution through the introduction of inferior methods. Thus, every new subfield that has come along in the 20th century has had a difficult time becoming accepted. Now, public history introduces challenging methods and concerns to the academy. The first thing to consider in, is that the struggle faced by public historians, by academic historians, begs the question, why bother? What's so good about being accepted by the academy? The answer is that public historians want to add to the practice of history as a discipline, which is now centered in these academic departments. They also want to improve the heretofore haphazard training of public history practitioners. They want to systematize that training, and they want to move it from training into education. That is, training teaches you how to do a set of tasks and how to think about improving performance and effectiveness in those tasks. Education teaches you how to see those tasks inside of the bigger picture, how they fit into a larger enterprise, why you should or should not do those tasks, and how to continue gathering knowledge and understanding 
to make your work more beneficial to everyone concerned. That is, education trains you in the ethos of the discipline, not just the craft of the discipline. Academic historians fear that public history is a craft rather than a profession. The public historians neither seek nor need education, only training. That educational achievement confers authority and status as well as intellectual rather than a practical approach. The status and authority is wrapped up in the way that we provide degrees. For example, among academic research historians, PhD is the terminal degree. PhD requires deep study, intense environments, and it yields a high level of intellectualism as a lifestyle. Now before you go poo-pooing intellectualism, it is just as legitimate a lifestyle, the life of the mind, as is any other lifestyle. It is also no more legitimate than any other life ways. That is, you can choose to be an intellectual or you can choose to be a, a craft worker. Neither of these things is better than the other. They produce economic benefits, they produce intellectual and emotional benefits, they're just different from one another. Public history has as its terminal degree often the master's degree. Even then, rather than emphasizing the philosophy of history, it privileges praxis. Praxis is the concept of putting theory into action thereby not privileging theory and not privileging intellectualism. So the academic historians are worried that by introducing public history as a sub-discipline that the public historians will drag the profession down out of its perch, self-imposed, somewhat arcane perch, of feeling like it's a philosophy rather than something that can be applied. Academic historians feel that public historians are less rigorous, and academics cherish rigor. Rigor is the adherence to established rules of truth, objectivity, though that's been somewhat debunked, and the ethos of the discipline. Among academic historians, and you've seen this, rigor appears in method, citations, formats, insistence that complication be privileged by including multiple instances and even contrary evidence. Rigor also appears in the inspectability of your sources. And if your results cannot be replicated, at least they can be understood by another historian going to your sources that you have rigorously inserted as citations into your writing. There is also, in order to ensure rigor, a vetting process, that is, peer review prior to publication. This ensures a controlled revision to the canon of historical literature. And, and at this point, you might be saying, oh my gosh, we're talking about a canon of historical literature, and we know that, that canons of literature are bad because they exclude so many people. And yet, it is the canon of literature around which historians as professionals organize themselves. Um, and, and there's a lot to criticize about that, and it is elitist, but it is how the academics behave, and they have an entire uh, infrastructure set up to protect this mechanism, this canon, and to insert revision, but in a controlled format. That is, they cherish the rigor of the process. Um, by having this vetting process of peer review, by 
controlling revision to the canon of historical literature. It enhances the authority of the published research project. Academic historians also fear that public historians are not autonomous, so they become mouthpieces for their employers. Academics believe that tenure and the idea of academic freedom make them intellectually autonomous. It lets them follow truth wherever that truth leads without fear of economic reprisals. Public historians, on the other hand, operate under more restrictions on their research and their research products. They're employed in businesses and in administrative environments like governmental bureaus, where supporting the brand is often privileged over fearless truth-seeking. Research is more like work for hire, and products don't necessarily get released without management approval. Management, rather than peers, become the vetting process in many cases. This may be good, it may be bad, it certainly puts public historians on kind of a different wavelength than academic historians. And so this is one of the reasons that academic historians fear public historians. But public historians bring value. They appeal to a broader audience. As Patricia uh, Mooney Melvin notes in our readings on this topic, professional historians have reduced their audiences by making their methods and products overly arcane. Public historians engage, however, with a, an audience in non-academic sites and with non-academic products, like reenactment, for example. Let's example, uh, e examine this idea of engagement. Engagement implies a rough equality in power and status, more or less, with an exchange of ideas. Public historians are not perceived as an intellectual elite necessarily, so they have a more egalitarian relationship with a public who ultimately relies on the philosophy of, quote unquote, the customer is always right, to push against elitism. Public history opens new avenues for the academic professional historians to gain public attention. Professional historians believe that long-form publication is the mark of the field. And by long-form, we mean things like articles and particularly books. In the academy, there's an infrastructure that rewards constant publications and sometimes hobbles those who produce other types of engagement and other types of writing. The National Council on Public History, the Organization of American Historians, the American Historical Association, are all working together to develop guidelines for university history departments to use when evaluating the academic contributions of publicly engaged historians. Public history is gaining a place in the halls of academia, driven in part by the reduction of jobs for new scholars in universities and greater opportunities for those new scholars in new arenas. Public historians want access to the academy in order to improve the practice of their own profession. Yet even while they confront problems in gaining the respect of academic historians, public historians must gain the respect of their audiences and share authority over knowledge and interpretation with those audiences. But that's the subject of our next lecture. This ends this lecture, and as always, Thank you very much for your attention.